Today, I am speaking with Courtney Fulmer. Welcome, Courtney. Thanks, John. Well, first, let me just congratulate you on your fairly recent rise to CEO at SECNY after a nationwide search. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And you've got a really unique perspective because you've been at the credit union for most of your professional career. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel pretty fortunate that we've had the chance to work together for a good sized portion of that time. And I also know you bring an interesting perspective um, to everything that you do. And I know because we've had, we've kind of co-interviewed on things before, and I think you're going to bring a lot to this Art of Allowance podcast. So if you're ready to get started, Courtney, I'd like you to just Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, I am Courtney Fulmer. I am our most recently promoted CEO at SECMY Federal Credit Union here in Syracuse, New York. Uh, you are correct, John. I have been with the credit union. I am currently working on year 24 of my career here, uh, starting out in sort of marketing and community relations, moving my way through operations and digital services, contact center, back office. So I've been very fortunate over my career to be able to experience so many different things and, and work with the incredible people that I've worked with. So, you know, I've been able to kind of see the ins and outs of the day to day. And I am really excited to take that with me as we kind of look bigger picture now in the role that I'm in and continue our growth going forward. I am living in Syracuse, obviously, near our branches. We've got six branches uh, within uh, central New York. Uh, I am with my husband and my son. They are huge music lovers. And my son is just starting marching band this year. So I've become a band mom too, in addition to CEO. <laughs> so I'm really, really excited about that this year as well. Well, I think you have some experience being a, a band member. And I think you were, weren't you in the color guard and the band? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I've run from color guard to dance to drum corps. We've done it all in our family. So we're kind of excited that our son is preparing to start that same journey. Very nice. Well, it's good to get the next generation uh, involved in that as well. Well, you know, we have, we've been working with credit unions for a long time, working with SCCNY um, especially. And you know, I read this article uh, that was going around. It's about this financially financial literacy epidemic. Um, this article seems to come out in some form every <laughs> couple of years. You know, in this one, it said 57% of Americans can't even score 50% on a financial literacy test, uh, which is confusing uh, enough. But the main point being that financial literacy is an issue. So I wanted to ask you, what do you think that credit unions and specifically SEC and why can do to try to address this epidemic or have been doing to try this to address this epidemic? Sure. So, you know, I think a lot of times when it comes to talking about tests, you know, we obviously we have to know a little more about the content, the participants, the demographics. You know, tests always open up questions to variables. So really addressing the statistic you know, requires knowing a little bit more about the makeup and the psychology. Um, and, you know, broadly, like any habit, good or bad, typically the earlier you and reinforce the better potential it has to stick and uh, really incorporating it into a daily home dynamic is impactful. And depending on your home life or your family support or your lack of, that really requires a deeper look for solutions. And that's something that we as a credit union recognized early on that you've got to look a little further than just providing information. You know, we have found in our travels that in some cases, students, you know, even in that 12, 13, 14 year old age range, they're in situations where they're also the caretakers of other family members. You know, so we spend time discussing how we as a credit union can support them gaining knowledge gaining that financial literacy when it might not be readily available or talked about or even embarrassing maybe to talk about at home. So from our perspective, we have it programmed all the way into our core values, specifically from our roots as an educationally based institution to provide not only resources and those physical tools like the Art of Allowance site or the mobile app Zogo, for example, but we also take a lot of time 
to spend with our staff and talk about the psychological support that's needed to deliver those meaningful interactions and those impressions to create good habits and outcomes and build on that financial literacy. You know, one of the things we, we've we had is a, a long time service initiative internally called We'll Do It For You. And we encourage members to contact us and our employees will walk them through products or services or situations or steps to success and address questions, difficulties. Maybe there's a referral we can make along the way. Uh, and we really look to train them to look for opportunities to provide not only the education, but also the empathy in all of those situations. Yeah. Can you go a little bit deeper? Because I think on the, the psychological support, I think that's such a big part of money because one of the difficult aspects of dealing with money, particularly I would say from a banking perspective, is that you have a lot of people in the banking world that just kind of get money, right? So it's not easy to get across when you kind of get money, how to get it across when really the issue for most people tends to be much, it's much more of a psychological issue, you know, it's just like dealing with, you know, needs and wants and whether you're, whether you're a kid or whether you're an adult, really understanding the psychology of money and how the psychology of money affects you, which tends to be something you can only learn through experience. So I just want to know, can you go a little bit deeper on how you can further help folks with that psychological support or things, programs you've seen that have worked? Any more on that? Sure. You know, so we do, it can be very simple things, you know, something where maybe someone had come in, they were looking for financing. We can't provide them the financing at this moment. There's never just an apology and a denial. But we work with our staff members to really kind of detail out with them what needs to be done so we can change the outcome to this in the future. And we talk a lot about education that includes specific, measurable, realistic steps wherever possible so that they feel empowered to try again. You know, that there is, it's not a hopeless situation at this particular moment. You know, we talk a lot about shame and how to address that potential feeling and remove that obstacle. And that one of the best ways that we can combat that is simply by being good listeners and listening to understand situations versus listening to respond with whatever the decisions are in that particular process. Mm -hmm. So as cooperatives, that's where credit unions really have the best opportunities because we're, we're already programmed in our DNA to work together and make conscious efforts. So we really, you know, try to keep continually reminding our staff that that listening is one of the most key pieces to helping address, you know, this this perceived statistics that statistic that um, you know, there's there's an illiterate uh, financial illiteracy epidemic. You know, so really listening and thinking about what is the situation that this person is in? What are the steps that they could take in the situation that they're in? And is there a referral that we could give them if they need additional help above and beyond what our staff is capable of doing? You got into the question I was going to ask, which is the money shame, which is something we've talked about a number of times with various guests on the podcast, is such a real issue that does feel like it could be potentially beyond the the uh, the training of the staff. But I actually wanted to ask you, so it sounds like you have done some staff training and how do you help them kind of understand where that, that line is with regard to like, okay, I can go up to this point and then it's time to maybe bring in another type of professional to deal with that kind of psychological aspects. Uh, I'm curious about that. Sure. So, um, we have uh, some education modules that we have created um, in our SECMY University program. That's our internal training program that we use for staff. And really, it's not even necessarily something that we, that we spend a ton of time on, but we do things like role play scenarios. Um, you know, we, there are some materials out there that, that can help you kind of set up situations for them to be able to, to kind of work through together in groups and, and really kind of play out. There's obviously a very fine line sometimes between financial advising and then also just providing information. So depending on the situation or the product or the service, you know, that's where we can draw on 
you know, some of our partners within the credit union, you know, so if there is a, you know, something that maybe start to border around maybe like a legal question or something like that, you know, we're not providing that advice, but we can give them somewhere to go to maybe find it. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. And it's great because that is one of the things it's so it's written into kind of credit unions uh, principles. And that's why it sounds like you're doing a really nice job with that in the community and helping to try to address the financial literacy uh, issues that are out there. So thank you for that, Courtney. So on the Art of Allowance podcast, I you know get to talk to kind of money experts, uh, people who are in the money business like yourself, parents, and often both like yourself. Mm -hmm. And what I like to do is just ask them about the kind of money smart journey. That's what we really talk about here on the Art of Allowance uh, project, the journey that you've taken with your kids. And I just wanted to start with, you know, how does the now CEO of a credit union, how do they start that money smart journey with their kids? Because I think a lot of people will be thinking, well, you've got it easy. You know all about money. Tell us all about this, the, the beginning of this journey, Courtney. Well, I think really, you know, the kickstart for me going on a money smart journey with children happened before our son was even born. And I remember sitting at my baby shower and my mother and I, it was my aunt, they had put together this beautiful hand painted piggy bank for my yet unknown that it was a son to be born. Um, and I remember looking at that piggy bank and I admittedly was instantly filled with fear over the reality that I was now not only responsible for my finances, but also the financial future of another human. And that was that was kind of overwhelming. And I, you know, I hadn't really meant to feel that way, you know, looking at it. But I, I still to this day remember standing there looking at the table with baby shower gifts and things and just that piggy bank stuck out so much to me. Um, and, and really being able to kickstart the journey for our son started with the family support. You know, we were very, very fortunate to have a family support system that allowed us from the start to be able to save on expenses like childcare and have the ability to save and create opportunities mm. to set him up to be money smart. And I recognize that that's definitely a privilege and that's not something that's in every person's situation, but that sole act really allowed us to start to become money smart on our own as adults and start good habits so that we could then share those successes and those failures with our son through age appropriate activities. And mm -hmm. that in turn has, you know, kind of created some really strong family bonds that, that we don't take for granted. Um, it started for us far before he was even uh, in our lives. Okay. So you, there is a big jump there from the fear, the paralyzing fear, which I totally understand that it actually is, was part of the kickoff for why we created the money mammals mm -hmm. to kind of feeling empowered. You went from that to that right mm -hmm. now you gave one reason, which is that you did have that family support and that that's a very, very good point. Anything else happen in that time where you went from paralyzing fear to more empowered that you can go a little bit deeper on? Well, I mean, truthfully, I think a lot of it was, you know, we were pretty open with our parents when we were starting out as a young married couple and, and you know, talking about things like savings and investment strategies. And, and up to that point, it really hadn't been something that was, you know, a loose part of conversation in, in family life, you know, on either of our sides. But you know, I think that the idea that there was this new tiny human coming into the world really, you know, sparked us to have that comfort level now to be able to ask questions and guidance from from our parents and, and our family. And what are the things that worked for them? And what are the things that didn't? And, you know, I, I always say my father in law is just one of the most amazing people in the universe. And he was such a great wealth of knowledge. And was so patient and respectful and, you know, really worked with us to understand, you know, we were both kind of new in the workforce at the time and, and to try to figure out how to look down the line and what are the things that we need to do. And we've tried to kind of incorporate some of those things that we learned from him into, you know, how we work with our son um, and, and, you know, to continue to, to talk about values and, and what is the value of 
the dollar or the time or the the thing that it is that you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that is wonderful. It's nice having those kind of people who are uh, your guides along the journey because, you know, you're trying to be a guide. You need a guide yourself. It's exactly very mm-hmm. similar to the path we've taken. So um, are there any, can you go deeper on on what your father-in-law provided um, or just like specific t- maybe tips and techniques or that he helped you with that you were able to kind of incorporate into your system with your son, maybe even tell us like, did you start with an allowance of what age was and, and, and how did your father-in-law um, beyond the obvious, which is just kind of opening your eyes to the importance of kind of seeing the future and how to set yourself up for a successful future with money. How else did that work as you were kind of getting started? And 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 feel free to get into the nitty gritty details. I think those are useful. Uh, those can be useful for parents. Yes. So we did, um, you know, most of what we, you know, talked about with you know, our family in the beginning, especially was, you know, talking about long range planning and things like 401ks. And, you know, my husband always likes to tell the story that the very first job he ever had, his father was on him about, you got to put money in the 401k. And, you know, he was like, I make like $30. Like, how is that even, you know, (laughs) you know, how does this work? You know, and, but he was so adamant about it that he's like, okay, I guess I better listen to my dad, you know? So, you know, those types of things are what he really helped us with. But then, you know, us kind of being able to start looking at that long range, that long term, you know, we started working with our son, you know, somewhat early. And, you know, of course we did what I would consider as a a typical thing to do as, as parents, which is set up an allowance. You know, he had a little chore chart, he had stickers. That kind of stuff really worked for him. You know, that's certainly recognizing that that type of system doesn't necessarily work for every child. But for him, you know, he, he was understanding of that and the tangibility of looking and or of having that, that reward, that physical thing to look at that said, oh, I accomplished something uh, worked well for him. You know, so we started out obviously with age appropriate things like, you know, moving your laundry to the laundry room, you know, (laughs) emptying the dishwasher, those types of things. And he really, you know, he, he took onto that pretty quickly. We didn't have to do a whole lot of support for that. You know, we've been very fortunate as parents that he's, he's kind of had a self drive from the beginning to want to do things. Um, And, and that worked very well for him. You know, we definitely employed, you know, right around the time, I think, we started working with the money mammals we, with the share, save, spend jars. It was, uh, you know, very applicable timing for us as parents too to start introducing those concepts as well to him. And, you know, for his age level at that time, he loved having those jars. It was something he could see. And nice. then, you know, as he's become older, you know, he certainly still has responsibilities, but we've, we've kind of stopped the, the, the monetary reward for those now, you know, he's starting to kind of get the the idea that, you know, he's growing up and, you know, you're not going to get paid to empty the dishwasher every time now. So <laughs> now he's taking those funds and those things that he was able to do as a child. And now it's, it's talking a little bit more complexity with him about what do people do with their money now when they earn money from their from their jobs? So the the content changes over time, but the start with those very tangible things, um, you know, creates the impressions. Yeah, very nice. Anything else that's changed now that he is fifteen? Like, is he is he working? Is he still saving in different buckets? Uh, or is there anything else that you've changed? Can you go any deeper on anything that's different? Yeah, I mean, certainly he's uh, he is uh, no stranger to digital technologies. So we we were I don't know, we might have been considered mean parents by making him wait till he was uh, 14 to get a phone. Um, But he didn't really have any, you know, mobile technology on his own until last year. Uh, So, you know, one of the things that we obviously worked with him on was how to manage his account electronically, because let's face it, that's what most people do these days. So, you know, teaching him about, you know, the safety involved and, you know, the the consequences for when you do certain things, uh, you know, that's all been more part of the conversation as he's grown older. And really a big part of it has been about the safety part. Yeah. 
I wouldn't call you mean parents. I would call you uh, very strong in the win uh, to be able to to do that is it's very impressive. So you held out there for a while. Kudos, yeah, kudos to you. So, what's one area where you think you maybe could have improved, or you wish you'd done differently? Is there anything that reflecting you would change? You know, I think really for the most part, I, I think we we created a good path for him. But I think in some cases we might have underestimated him a little bit in his ability to make connections uh, to values of things. Like I, I think if I could change one thing, I would you know maybe have introduced him to you know, maybe things like household expense management a little bit earlier. You know, we use trips to, to Costco as opportunities to talk about that type of thing, you know, but I, and I think we waited until he was older, certainly with the intent that he might understand better. But I think sometimes, you know, we underestimate exactly how much our, our younger kids can absorb and truly understand. So, you know, I think from, a, you know, from that perspective, maybe we would have touched on a couple of topics maybe a little bit earlier because I think he probably could have handled it. Yeah, that makes sense because they really are just information absorption machines. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that, that is so true. Okay. So I want to ask you uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is, um, this is a little bit out of uh, left field. Well, no, I'll ask you the first one. So what is an important kind of truth about financial literacy or money you learned that very few people agree with you about? Ooh, that's a good one. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't know if I could say that very few people uh, agree, but I could certainly think of a couple that, you know, would probably raise some eyebrows a little bit. And that is that, you know, I think there's, there's some definite truth in the fact that financial literacy itself can often fail. Uh, you know, years ago, I remember reading an article that once stated that financial literacy is the wrong starting point to success. And that statement really piqued my interest at first because, mm. you know, I had always kind of rolled along with the idea that, you know, the knowledge is power and that's the most powerful tool. But the more I read on it, you know, it was, it was so logical to connect that financial literacy programming, you know, often addresses the technical aspects of money but doesn't always tie in the emotions and the psychology like we talked about that go in tandem with all of that. And in reality, you know, our feelings drive our decisions, not necessarily logic. And while we hope that the ultimate success would be calling upon financial literacy content to influence feelings, you know, that's not always the case. So I, I don't know if I would say that's widely disagreed with, especially today with the amount of information that we have. But I, I know I initially raised an eyebrow at that statement before I became more versed and used that information to really kind of switch gears for us as the credit union and add that, you know, that layer of empathy and the concept of listening to understand and not just to respond within our staff education. So I thought that was, you know, definitely a truth that exists out there that maybe not everyone agrees with. I think this is a very interesting thread. Are you able to go any deeper on that, Courtney? Because I think you've you're kind of on to something there. Well, I think, you know, it's it's again looking back at the things that are surrounding the knowledge. You know, it's one thing to have the knowledge and to have access to the tools and and all of that is exceptionally important. But you have to look at everybody's individual situations and, you know, think about, you know, what their drivers are for living their life. You know, we're, we're not, you know, financial literacy can be very technical and it'll give you the, you know, the math or, or you know, the, the things, the science behind certain things, but the human feelings and the, you know, the situations that you're in, you know, that's what we use to, to make decisions you know, whether they're financial or not, you know, a lot of times we're, we're acting on that emotion um, and that feeling, you know, maybe in the moment. And so while financial literacy, you know, having that technical knowledge and that understanding is what we hope, you know, gets used to kind of influence the decision, you know, you, you're, you're talking about individuals and humans with, with wide and vast experiences or backgrounds or, you know, social 
you know, backgrounds. It's, it's, it's a, it's such an interesting field that I think you could really, you know, go very deep down a rabbit hole with this to, uh, you know, to really come out with some, some ideas and, and uh, some interesting information. We can definitely go down some rabbit holes and, uh, (laughs) and I, I appreciate that answer. I think that's, very useful information because uh, that the the psychology of money is such a huge part of it. It's one thing to understand that you know you should uh, buy low and sell high, and that you should stick it out in the midst of uh, you know the stock market dropping. But it's much different when everybody around you is running around like a chicken with their head cut off, and <laughs> you don't really know what to do. And uh, I'm sorry about that imagery. I'm not sure that's the best imagery to use, but hair on fire. How about the hair on fire imagery? <laughs> but you're getting at a key point here, which is that you have the kind of rational, but you know, the rational way that we think about money, but really it's the psychological aspect that really impacts individuals' lives, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So. Can you tell me who it's, well, I think you probably uh, already answered this question, but I will ask it again, which is who's the most influential person in your life when it comes to the way that you think, think about kind of financial literacy or money smarts. You mentioned your father-in-law, but perhaps there is someone else as well. Yes. So certainly he, he's high up there on the list, but my grandfather, he's always the one. I always call my pop-up into mind when I'm thinking about any sort of financial decision. He, he was an avid stock market follower when he was alive. And it was like the most intensely fun thing for him. And I always just thought that was so interesting because it did not seem interesting to me. And I had no interest in anything like that, especially as a child, you know, but (laughs) he had such a passion for it. And he was very vocal, um, you know, within our family about talking about investing and making smart decisions. And to think, you know, from his time and the things that he experienced throughout his life, you know, one of my favorite phrases is, one that he used to say to us all the time as children, and that was to pay yourself first. And that from his perspective, because he was such an avid stock market follower and and he was so into the financial world, so he was meaning it more from the financial perspective. But to me, it always sort of expanded into he's got something there, you know, with that pay yourself first, you know, not only do I need to think about investing in, you know, financially and thinking about saving and, and, and things for down the road, but also, you know, paying myself first in the form of, you know, time to do things that I love, rest, you know, taking care of, of my family, you know, looking at my health and well-being. And he's probably the most influential person to me with even just that simple statement. That's wonderful, particularly about that paying yourself uh, via time. Because that mm-hmm. is you know, that is one resource we can never get back. So that is uh, that's very insightful on his part, and I'm glad uh, that he was able to impart that um, to you. Is there anything else that he sounds like a, a font of wisdom? Is there any other wisdom that you can <laughs> and you can share with us that came from your grandfather? You know, I could probably go on for hours with stories about him because he was just. <laughs> You know, my my brother and I, when we were younger, my mother uh, was an uh, an Avon representative, and my father uh, was in marketing for an auto company. And you know, he traveled a lot for his job, and my mom would have her Avon deliveries to do every other Friday during the week. So we spent a lot of time. We spent a lot of weekends, twice a month, with my grandparents. And my grandfather was just one of the most patient, kind people that. And all of those things, all of those those traits and those those qualities, I think I've always strived to be like him, you know, as I as I've grown up. And, you know, the wisdom that he really, you know, provided for me was not necessarily in words. He wasn't really a guy of too many words, but in the actions, you know, supporting our family, you know, taking time to spend with us, you know, with his grandkids and creating experiences for us, you know, that's that's the wisdom that I've taken with me from him is in what he did in addition to some of the things that he said. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Okay. Before we head into the fast and fun round questions, Courtney, I have to ask you one other question, which is 
What did you learn in band or color guard that has helped you become the credit union leader you are today? Oh, that's a great question. I have learned so many lessons that I've brought with me from the marching band and the color guard world to the credit union space. And they might not seem like parallels really, but there, there's so much. And a lot of it was really under that leadership umbrella. And I have been very, very fortunate to be on staffs in the past with the marching band and the drum corps that had exceptional leaders. And the common thread among all of those was that that empathetic piece. You know, when you're working with with high school kids, you know, day in, day out, and you're working with different personalities and different backgrounds and, and understandings, all of that, unbeknownst to me at the time, was really preparing me to start leading teams from the credit union perspective. Mm. Uh, you know, so... It's funny that sometimes certain situations will come up and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I remember this on the field in, you know, July of 2001. And it's almost the same situation that I was working with with one of the students, you know, so I was very fortunate to be able to look up to the leaders of our staff and their uh, their traits and their actions and, and use that to kind of drive myself to have those, you know, to emulate those same things. And certainly, you know, from the team building perspective, the marching band and color guard provided such a fantastic experience to really know what it's like to work together as a team, to create that successful performance, to learn from each other's mistakes. You know, all of those things are things that you carry with you into your adult life, no matter what industry or path you go down. Very nice. Appreciate that, Courtney. I think now you're ready for the fast and fun round questions. Bring it on. (laughs) All right, here we go. So what does the term money empowered mean to you? So to me, money empowered means that I have somehow experienced successes and failures to kind of build my catalog of knowledge and uh, take actions to make better financial decisions. Very nice. What is the best investment of time or money you've ever spent on your son? I would say travel, hands down. Uh, You know, we have we have a a phrase in our house where we call our vacations or our trips. uh, We we take ourselves off our home screens and we scroll the world. And (laughs) that has produced some of the most amazing experiences and memories. And, um, you know, my husband and my son have started this. They call it a big brain trip tradition, and they're both really into science and music, and they started a couple years ago setting aside time each year for a trip to experience one or both concepts. You know, So for example, a couple years ago, they went to uh, Washington, D.C., and they went to see Neil deGrasse Tyson and the musical Hamilton. Uh, last year, they went to Houston and visited uh, the Space Center at NASA, and then they attended Wicked. You know, so this has enhanced my son's interest and desire to learn about things like music theory and relate to the science concepts he's exploring in school. So the, the travel has definitely been something that, you know, we are adamant about doing and opting for those experiences you know, without too much laser focus on the the dollars and cents of it, maybe. I love that. That's great. Very, very interesting. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that is a first, and I appreciate that. I think that's something that uh, people are going to take away from and start doing their big brain trips. I like that idea. Sounds very, uh, I was just watching a documentary on Richard Feynman, you know, the physicist, and mm-hmm. he was also, he was a bongo player, a fairly accomplished bongo player, but became a fairly accomplished drafts person. And they showed some of the pictures that he originally drew, which were comically bad. And then how he kind of evolved into a very good drafts person, but he Mm -hmm. kind of like combined all of that. And it's really all driven by curiosity, which is exactly what it sounds like is driving your son and, uh, and your, and your husband. So what advice uh, to your son do you most hope that he'll heed in the financial realm? In the financial realm? Okay. Uh, you know what? In any realm, you can go anywhere, anywhere. Yeah, well, I think, you know, 
overall life advice, you know, we have another, you know, kind of three prong approach in our house. And that's work hard, be kind, do good with emphasis on being kind and, you know, trying to really keep in check judgment throughout life. You know, kids have access to a lot of things these days that can certainly help speed up judgment. Um, and the truth is that you never really know what someone might be going through in life. So, you know, that work hard, be kind, do good is always something that we have reinforced in our household. And then, you know, really from a financial perspective, you know, I hope that, you know, he continues to, uh, you know, hone in on his understanding of value and that values may vary throughout life. And then, you know, when he has questions or he's unsure, you know, we as parents have always told him, you know, when in doubt, seek us out. You know, we want to make sure that he has that, again, kind of psychological comfort in knowing that he can come to his parents if he has questions for something um, or about something. And we want to, you know, promote that open communication as much as possible for him so that he can do good things. Very nice. Open communication across all domains, money, life. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> all makes sense. So if you could transmit a message that everyone would see, skywritten, billboard, wherever, what would that message say, Courtney? Well, you know, I think I would have to call back on my my pop pop again. And I think that pay yourself first would be something I would definitely put as a message to everyone out there and, you know, accompany that with that understanding that that paying yourself first, you know, is not only you know, a financial message, but also in, again, that time to rest, time to do things you love, spend time with people who mean something to you, because that type of investment pays greatly over time for your your health and, and your well-being. So, um, you know, something I don't know that gets said a lot to people today, you know, and making sure that you're investing in yourself, you know, not only from the financial perspective. It's wonderful. Thank you. So what is the one Money Smarts book, podcast, or really any other media that you go back to or that you gift the most often? Well, I would say certainly for the young people in my life, and I, I can't say that I've necessarily gifted it, but we always read Joe the Monkey Saves for a Goal when I have the opportunity to to read with young children or, or, or things like that, or my nieces and nephews. But for, for older kids and adults, I would say maybe it's not necessarily considered a specific money smarts item, but I have very frequently gifted like a goals or a gratitude journal on occasions. And I usually start that first page by writing a hope or a wish or a positive thought for them. Uh, you know, I've long believed that if you're intentional and especially if you write it down, you're more likely to pursue those positive thoughts and actions. And then, you know, hopefully that in turn influences decision making and perhaps leading the way to better financial ones along your journey. Very nice. Thank you very much uh, for mentioning the book. That's very nice of you. And I really like that idea of uh, kind of kickstarting the gratitude journal as a gift. That's mm -hmm. a really, really smart way to go about that. Well, thank you, Courtney. This has been wonderful. I want to ask you, how can people find you to the extent that you want them to find you uh, on social media or the web? Sure. So I am on LinkedIn. Certainly, I would welcome anybody to try to get a hold of me there. Um, that's probably the, the easiest way if there's any questions or uh, anyone would like to chat after the fact, that would be probably the best option. Very nice. And is there any action that any of us can take to help you? Right now, but I, I have received so much support from especially the, the CEO community here in, in New York State over the last couple of months. And I always say that I think credit unions are just such a unique industry that there's this true spirit of cooperation among all of them where I've really never seen anything like it, where people are so willing to work with each other, even though they may be competitors in certain markets or places like that, that, you know, it would be my hope that that spirit continues, um, no matter whether it's, you know, competitors or our vendors and our partners, um, you know, so just that that cooperative spirit and, and really looking to help us, uh, you know, find solutions or create new ideas, you know, that energy 
uh, from from those partnerships. Uh, that's what I, I hope for that I think will be the biggest help, uh, especially for me going forward. Well, Courtney, I really appreciate you taking the time. It's fun to talk to someone who you've known for a long time and who continues to surprise you with these uh, kind of bombs of wisdom that you're dropping on us from you and from your pop-pop. Uh, it was really, really fun to have this conversation. So thanks for coming on the Art of Allowance podcast. Absolutely. This was so much fun. Thank you.